My name is Todd Sedgwick. I'm the U.S. Ambassador here in Slovakia, and uh, I want to welcome everybody to our face-to-face -face program. And uh, we've got a very interesting program tonight, and I want to thank all of you for uh, coming for the discussion. Um, these face-to-face -face programs are really uh, designed to have a discussion. Uh, now, we at the U.S. Embassy sponsor these, but the purpose is not to sell some message from the U.S. Embassy, but really to have more of a debate or a discussion about the issue. So, as you all know, we in the United States uh, are uh, very much in favor of LGBT rights. It's interesting because in the United States, these rights are quite different from state to state. Each state uh, decides, its, for the most part, its own rights. However, um, as you may know, President Obama himself has come out for for example, gay marriage, and we do uh, promote gay rights around the world. So, for example, um, I'll be marching in the uh, parade tomorrow, uh, well, this weekend, this Saturday, which, which I've done in the past, and uh, so we're very proud and happy to support the notion of gay rights uh, generally. So, um, I'm very pleased to welcome our uh, distinguished panelists this evening, and uh, First of all, Jan Kurt from Vienna, from our U.S. Embassy in Vienna, Counselor for Public Affairs, and uh, I've worked with Jan in the past on other issues in, in the Embassy of Vienna, so thank you for coming over. It's not too far, but still you're making an effort. Also from Vienna, uh, Vienna Dennis Vandervoort, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Dennis is the Program Manager for the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. And uh, Martin Matsko here is the executive director of Initiativa Inacost, deputy chair of the LGBT, LGBT committee. Uh, Olga Petrukova, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, director of gender equality department at the Ministry of Labor, uh, Social Affairs and Family of the Slovak Republic. Uh, and Julia Smythe, who is the uh, acting deputy head of mission at the British Embassy here in Bratislava, who's my neighbor up the street. <laughs> so, uh, welcome all of you, and thank you very much for coming for uh, what, what I know will be a lively discussion, and we're also counting on your active participation in the uh, conversation later. So, thank you very much again for coming. Thank you, Ambassador Sikker. Thank you. Dobry večer, dámy páni. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, although I didn't come from far, it still is a treat to get out of Vienna and be in another country so nearby. So uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Jan Kirch, and as the ambassador said, I'm the Counselor for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Vienna. And um, I come to this partly because of my own history. I've served in seven countries, uh, Belgrade, um, Istanbul, Frankfurt, Germany, St. Petersburg, Russia, Prague, Budapest. So I've been circling this area, now I'm in Vienna. But some years ago, nearly 30 years ago, I was separated from the Foreign Service uh, because back then, of course, we were not as encouraging of LGBT rights as we are today, so I'm happy to, to, to note the huge progress we've made. But back in the 80s, people were actually separated from their job based on being gay. So these things did happen and we are here to make sure that they never happen again. So I'm very happy to, to be here, and if I can contribute in any way, I will be happy to answer questions uh, about the situation in the United States today, which is much better, as the ambassador pointed out. But we're here to, to speak about Slovakia, so to get going on that, let me give you a little bit more information about our panel. Uh, starting from, uh, on my left here, Mr. Martin Matsko. Uh, who is the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee for Rights of LGBT People, Advisory Body for the Slovak Government, and also the Executive uh, Director of Initiativa Inakost. Uh, Inakost is the Slovak Umbrella LGBTI organization, and the aim of the association is the advocacy and promotion of rights of LGBTI people and uh, detection and elimination of all forms of discrimination based on uh, the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity and liberation from homophobia. 
He's also the coordinator of project monitoring of the implementation of the international and national obligations in human rights of LGBT people in Slovakia. So uh, I should also add that he's a, a PhD history candidate at the Institute for Historical Studies at the Faculty of Philosophy of Menius University in Bratislava. And he has uh, two master degrees, if I read this correctly, uh, from Comenius University uh, in uh, European Studies and in History from the Faculty of Philosophy, again, from Comenius University. Next to him, we have Ms. Julia Smyth. Good. Who's been in Slovakia since June 2013. And she is currently, hmm, something between a charge d'affaire and the deputy head of mission. So, important position. And she joined the foreign office in 1984. She has a background in international relations and a master's in business administration. Uh, she has worked on a diverse range of diplomatic issues and a wide range of posts, including Tunis, Paris, Dhaka, Nairobi, Sofia, and in the Middle East. Anyway, so we'll be getting a perspective there from the UK, which, according to a map I just saw a minute ago, has one of the most favorable ratings in all of Europe. In fact, the most favorable, I think it was. To her left is Ms. Olga. Ah, you might as well show it off. The dark green is the best rating, and that is the UK. Um, of course, the U.S. is not included, but never mind. Uh, Ms. Olga Pietruchová, uh, to her left, is an expert in the field of gender equality, gender mainstreaming, and equal opportunities, gender trainer and advocate for human rights with more than 10 years of experience. She holds a Master of Arts in Women's Studies and Feminist Research degree from Rose Mayrader College in Vienna, Austria. In her career, Ms. Petrikova used to serve as a chairwoman of the Slovak Women's Lobby and member of the governing board of European Women's Lobby in Brussels, as well as the executive director of the Slovak Family Planning Association. Since 2011, she works as the director of the Department of Gender Equality and Equal Opportunities at the Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, and the Family of the Slovak Republic. Due to her position, she is also a board member of the European Institute of Gender Equality and member of the EU High Level Group on Gender Mainstreaming and the Secretary of the Committee on Gender Equality of the Governmental Council on Human Rights, Gender Equality and Equal Opportunities. Ms. Petrikova is an author or co-author of several publications and studies on gender equality and equal opportunities and has conducted gender training and analysis for national and international organizations such as UNDP, Oxfam, and the European Commission. She is also a well-known publicist in Slovakia with more than 150 articles published in Slovak newspapers and magazines. And last but not least, Mr. Denis van der Boer, who is the program manager at the Equality Citizens' Rights Department of the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU. Uh, his area of expertise include equality, LGBT, hate crime, civil society, and networking. Before joining the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU, he was the advisor to the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights and monitoring officer at the OSCE Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. He is the author of several articles, including Homosexuality in Southeastern Europe and EU Enlargement, a Gay Perspective. He also co-authored an article on hate crimes against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons and the policy response of international governmental organizations uh, that was published in the Netherlands Quarterly of Human Rights. He has postgraduate degrees in educational science from the University of Amsterdam and Human Rights and Democratization uh, European, from the European Inter-University Center in Venice. So it's great to have you here. Thank you all. And I think we might as well just jump right into things. So I think I will ask uh, Dennis if he would mind to give us a little bit of a presentation of the uh, Department of the Fundamental Rights Agency's uh, uh, research. Thank you very much. Actually, there are five chairs here, three, so anyone from behind who wants a chair can join in. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. 
It's actually my first time in Slovakia, which is funny because we're based in Vienna. Um, I would assume I would have been here before. But we're very happy to be here for um, the simple reason that we conducted a large research in all EU 28 countries on the human rights of LGBT people. And um, we have very few opportunities to actually go and to the several countries and to present the results, uh, which is extremely uh, rich, the survey. So what we did is to, uh, in last year, for three months, put online a survey, an online survey, which people could fill out anonymously, everybody who identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender persons. Um, and we uh, wanted to know their experiences of discrimination, violence, um, ridicule, and to put that in a larger EU perspective. We did this research because it was asked for by the European Commission. Ms. Vivian Redding herself, the Commissioner for Fundamental Rights, wanted to know more about the situation in the EU. Um, so we conducted this, uh, this survey. We did similar research on, on the Roma, the situation of the Roma, uh, ethnic minorities. We're going to publish a, a research on anti-Semitism very soon. So we have a larger experience of conducting such large surveys. Um, so we um, attracted 93,000 respondents, which is an absolute um, success. We never had so many people participating in all 28 EU countries. Um, and we conducted the research in all official EU languages. So those of you here in the room who have participated may remember that you were able to fill out in your own language this, uh, this survey. It was online for um, three months. And um, as you can see here, um, we attracted from Slovakia 1,000 respondents, uh, which is not a bad number looking at the overall um, number. Of course, the bigger countries, Italy, Germany, etc., have much more respondents, but we're, we're very happy with the thousand uh, respondents from Slovakia, who, as I said, identified as being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. We had an, uh, should be said, acknowledged, we had an over-representation of gay men in the, in the, in the research. Um, but having said this, um, we we're very happy with the, with the break with the numbers. Now, we, we, did, we, we started by asking something about the background of the, the people who we, who we interviewed. And here you can see, for example, the, those who live together with a partner um, or with, uh, with a spouse. Uh, and you can see the, the, the figure for Slovakia being 23%, a bit lower. So 23% of the respondents in Slovakia, 23% of the 1,000, live together with a partner or a spouse, which I think is very interesting information for policymakers who want to know more about who are the LGBT people in, in, in Slovakia. We also asked where the children live in the household of our thousand respondents. And here you can actually see that Slovakia uh, is very high. 17% of the people who participated have uh, somebody below 18 living in the household so the reality of some of the LGBT people in this country are that there are children living in this household. Now, apart from the background information, we, we focused basically on four areas. Discrimination on the labor market, uh, discrimination and ridicule um, in the educational sector, and we looked at issues around health and access to goods and services. So, accessing the restaurant, the bar, etc. And we, prov we uh, collected up to 23,000 uh, quotes. People left short stories when we asked them at the end of the survey, do you want to elaborate a little bit more? And I, for this particular meeting, I selected a couple of um, uh, quotes from Slovakia. Um, you can read this, I cannot, but I approximately know what's, what's there. And we have a lot of similar uh, uh, quotes collected from this country. Now, the research, of course, is based in, uh, uh, we didn't just come up with the questions. Um, our work is rooted in uh, the EU acquis, um, the particular the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which clearly states that discrimination based on many grounds, including sexual orientation, is not uh, allowed. Um, and in, in this spirit, I want to say, we, we have conducted this research. 
One of the first questions we asked, to what extent people felt discriminated against or harassed on the grounds of sexual orientation in the last year. Um, and here you can see the, um, the outline per country. In Slovakia, it was 52% uh, of people indicated that they felt discriminated in the last year. That is not to say that uh, this is, has been proven in court, but this is the feeling people had when we asked them this question. On the right side of this table, you can actually see the, the breakdown per group. And one could see that lesbian uh, women actually reported higher numbers than uh, some of the other groups. Then we focus on some of the areas, employment, to start with. And again, we start with, with a quote here. Again, in the, uh, in the area of employment, it's actually one of the few areas in EU legislation that we have clear legislation where discrimination based on sexual orientation is outlawed. Unfortunately, when it comes to gender identity, and I'll speak a bit more about that, we have not so clear um, uh, wording in the current directive, although the Court of Justice uh, has recognized that those who are discriminated against as a result of gender reassignment should also be protected. Now, when we ask people, have you felt discriminated against in your job or when looking for a job uh, because of being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, one out of five respondents uh, answered positively. And in particular, transgender people uh, responded, uh, up to 30% of those that we asked responded that they felt discriminated against because of their gender identity. The, number, the figure for Slovakia is somehow in the middle compared to the EU comparative. It's exactly 20%, uh, which reflects um, the level in this country. Of course, one of the, the ways to combat discrimination, very importantly, is that people actually know that there is a law forbidding discrimination. So we asked people that whether they were aware of the fact that there is a law uh, forbidding discrimination. And you can see the breakdown. On average, 56% in the EU is aware of law with, particularly in Sweden and the UK, people with very high awareness, up to 84%. Uh, other countries, uh, including Italy, Greece and Cyprus, have very, very low awareness numbers. Slovakia is a bit below the EU average. 45% indicated that they are aware of a law that they can actually use when they feel discriminated or want to bring a case to court. Education, the second big sector that we looked at, and this is uh, one of the areas where uh, the results were pretty disturbing. Uh, in all of the countries, including in countries that are known to be very LGBT friendly, uh, almost everyone reported uh, very bad experiences of their time at school. And I only took one quote here uh, that a gay man of a 24 year old in Slovakia has reported to us. Now, we asked people to what extent they have been hiding their sexual orientation. Did they dare to come out when they were at schools? Just remember, our respondents were of, uh, of different parts of the country. Some were young, some were old. But these were the figures that we got. 67% uh, uh, of our respondents indicated that they were hiding their sexual orientation or gender identity during their time at school. Uh, with, again, some differences per country. Uh, Slovakia is um, somewhere in the middle, but you can see that even in... Uh, so, actually, Slovakia is pretty much on the good side with this question. But the, the, you can see that there is very little um, difference per country, uh, and also among the, the target groups. People, and we knew that from other research already, do not have an easy time at school when it comes to be able to come out. We also asked to what extent they were aware of negative comments, being bullied at school, and we found, again, very high numbers. I realize it's a bit hard to read. We have everything, of course, printed on paper. But here, again, you can see that up to 70% uh, heard comments um, uh, being called names, faggot, etc., um, negative comments about themselves or about teachers or fellow schoolmates. Again, very few, very little uh, differences per country. In the area of education for the lawyers in the room, uh, of course, in, we have little competence on an EU level when it comes to uh, uh, combating bullying and discrimination in education. However, policy makers, hopefully also here in Slovakia, when seeing those, those figures 
there is really reason to, to act, to start programs combating discrimination and ridicule. Now, of course, people say, okay, I was discriminated, but do people actually go and report a case of discrimination? And here we found again very uh, disturbing numbers. Only 10% of people who felt discriminated actually went to report that to an equality body or another institute. And actually, again, you can see that the numbers are pretty equal for, for most of the country in the, in the European Union, with Slovakia up to 6%. But again, uh, the highest number we found in, in Italy, 16%, is still very low. So there is a need for equality bodies, for institutions that are actually there to take those complaints, to somehow reach out to, to the community and make sure that people report a case if they feel discriminated. Of course we ask, why did you not report? Because those institutions are there. And the reason we heard most often was, we don't think anything would happen, would change. It's not worth reporting it. Sometimes people didn't want to reveal their sexual orientation or gender identity uh, because of being afraid um, to, to come out. So again, we have, we have work to do. Uh, the institutions have, have work to do. Finally, the area of violence and harassment. Now, this is an area that uh, one could say is the, the most um, disturbing um, when something, a hate incident happens to you. And we asked a couple of questions in this regard. We asked people whether they had been uh, attacked uh, violently, by whom, uh, when it happened, uh, etc. And we found the following information. Yeah. So we asked people whether they had experienced violence in the last five years, in the last year, the most recent and the most serious incident. And we found, looking at the last five years, that um, um, approximately 25% of all respondents had been at least once a victim of a hate crime or a hate incident. That could be anything from uh, being attacked on the streets to uh, uh, really being um, uh, sexually harassed, uh, etc. It was a broad world category. And again, what we saw in the survey, what also was clear from other questions, the transgender community reported again higher numbers. And actually, when we looked a little bit more to the data, uh, repeated victimization was a big problem, is a big problem for the transgender community. Some people, uh, up to 33%, I believe, uh, has been attacked three times per year on, on an annual basis. And again, this is a, uh, we have problems. Um, this group has um, reported a lot of problems to us. Again, when we ask them, did you go to the police, did you report uh, the incident or the crime? Because at least in more than half of the EU member states, we have a law outlawing violence uh, against LGBT people. Um, I understood also in Slovakia now there is a law that recognizes hate crime based on sexual orientation, not, the, not uh, gender identity. But actually we ask, do people use the law and did you go? Again, a disturbing picture can be shown. 17% only went to report, which is really a low number. Um, in fact, the transgender people reported a bit better, but uh, still the numbers are, are, are very low. Now, to, to, to bring this back also to a daily life uh, matter, of course, there are many other questions that we ask, and just to show a couple of quotes that we collected. Um, of course, perhaps the most, the, the next slide, yeah. We, we ask a very simple question at the very end. We ask them, do you dare to hold the hand of your partner on the street? Sounds very simple, but perhaps a very everyday experience for many different sex couples. You go out, hold the hand of your partner. And again here we see that um, um, there are some differences per countries, but up to 90% um, of, the, of the people in our survey from most countries did, did report that they basically were afraid to be assaulted, attacked when holding hands in public. Um, looking at particular groups, would, we could see that particularly gay men and bisexual men didn't dare to, lesbian, bisexual women, women a bit more. But again, these are disturbing figures for everyone who believes in fundamental rights. 
to end on a positive note, um, of course, we, we want with this research to inform policymakers in the EU, but also uh, national member states. And we ask them what our respondents think could be done to improve the situation. Um, and firstly, we ask them, do you think that in your country, actually, the government has positive measures in place to promote respect for the human rights of LGBT people? Do you think it is very rare or does it happen very often? And one could see, looking at um, Slovakia, that in this regard, uh, I cannot find it, where is it? Oh yeah, 89% of our respondents, of our 1,000 respondents in Slovakia, 89% believes that it's very rare that the government has policy or policy measures in place. Uh, in some other countries, uh, including the country where I come from, the Netherlands, but also in the UK, Sweden, Belgium, respondents were more positive. These are also the countries, by the way, that have action plans to promote LGBT human rights. Uh, a long-standing tradition in some cases. So one could say that policy pays off. Policy matters and setting up policies actually result that the target group realizes uh, that some is, something is done by the government. We ask the same question uh, in relation to transgender people. You can see the, uh, the slightly more uh, negative responses in this regard. Um, now, of course, all of this um, leads to the question, what can be done, what should be done? Uh, we have released a report that you could find um, on your chair. We have more copies. Uh, we have phrased, shaped a couple of opinions where we are very uh, precise in terms of what should be done in the field of education, what should be done in the field of employment. And um, without going through, to go through all the different opinions, the bottom line is um, it is important that a dialogue starts between different actors, between civil society, government, but also professional groups. Um, you can actually draw your own report if you want. Um, excellent material for researchers, for policy makers, and we hope that our work will be, uh, will be useful uh, here in Slovakia and as well as in other countries. And um, I look forward to discussing the results with you. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very much. That certainly was a, an excellent and very comprehensive survey. Um, I just wanted to comment on something I've seen in the printed materials here on Slovakia, which talks about a Eurobarometer uh, devoted to the issue of discrimination from November of 2012 that shows that social acceptance of LGBT people in Slovakia is the second lowest in all the EU countries, and discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is the second most widespread form of discrimination in Slovakia. So with that, I'd like to now turn to Mr. Matsko to maybe tell us more about the research and the data that served as the basis of this statement from LGBTI. I would like to appreciate the work of European Agency for um, fundamental rights that has produced uh, this biggest research and survey uh, that was carried out not only in Slovakia but also in Europe because uh, the Slovak governmental institutions have not shown any interest in finding out what is the, situ the real situation, everyday situation of their LGBT citizens. Data on discrimination is extremely important because when we don't know, and if, if we cannot show on the hard data that there is a problem, then the politicians uh, totally neglect the problem and they say that, well, there is no problem and nothing needs to be done. And this is the situation, this has been the situation for the past 20 years. And this is really for the first time, and this is not thanks to the Slovak government, that we have the hard data that we can work with and that we can use for a potential change. This was not the only research or survey that has been carried out there were other 
uh, activities and projects carried out on a European level, Eurobarometer that finds out and that maps uh, the positions and perspectives of European citizens on various issues, and one of the questions related discrimination. And uh, the question was whether uh, the p uh, citizens would or would not mind if the president of the Slovak Republic was gay, lesbian, or transgender, and Slovakia came as the second worst country in Europe after, uh, with the last being Lithuania. Uh, then uh, in May, uh, sorry, Latvia, excuse me, Latvia. Uh, then uh, in July, uh, there was another research uh, presented, European Social Survey, that also posed this question, one of the really basic questions regarding tolerance. And the question was um, to the Slovak respondents and to all other respondents whether the, the respondent would agree that uh, LGBT people can live their life uh, as they want. That means have a freedom of life and the way they live their life and uh, only 43% of the Respondees in Slovakia agreed that yes, LGBT people have right to do so, and this uh, result actually shows uh, that actually the number of respectful people is decreasing. Slovakia has not made any step forward within the past seven years in this area. We haven't got any better. The situation is actually getting worse. Uh, so, one way or another, or still, we hope that a change is going to come. Thank you, Mr. Matsko. And now, uh, if I could ask Ms. Smythe to maybe present uh, a little bit about the situation in the UK and, and any lessons that there might be there for the Slovak, uh, I guess, the Slovak audience here. Great. Um, well, thank you very much. It's um, an honor to be here, and um, it's great to see that we do have um, the highest level of liberty um, in Europe, but um, this also is one of the highest in the world. So, um, um, when Jamal asked me to uh, do this presentation, um, I looked on the internet to see what was good practice, um, and I have to say, I was overwhelmed, and I have this fistful of papers here, of lots and lots of good practice um, that we do conduct. Um, so, I mean, basically, um, it's quite horrific that um, back in um, 1533, <laughs> um, um, so we've got here that um, homosexuality, uh, homosexuality was outlawed and punishable by death. But following on now, um, really, it's since the turn of the 21st century that LGBT rights have um, strengthened in support. Um, and so um, it is good to see um, that LGBT citizens have most of the same legal rights um, as um, non-LGBT um, LGBT citizens, so, which is good news. Um, Jamal did ask me to um, talk about good practice, um, and as I said, it was so overwhelming that I might just I outline um, a little bit more of what we do in foreign affairs, um, uh, because as I say, um, there are equal rights in the UK. Um, so um, I thought I'd talk a bit more about um, protection and promotion of rights uh, of LGBT um, is really an integral part of the government's wider international human rights agenda. And we believe that human rights are universal and should apply equally to all its people. Um, so unfortunately, um, this position is not um, universally shared, as you can see from um, the map here. Um, and according to the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, 76 countries still retain laws 
that discriminate against people on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And in at least five countries, the death penalty may be applied to those found guilty of offences related to consexual same-sex uh, sex relations. Now, internationally, the LGBT um, community continue to experience um, violation and abuse of the human rights, including torture and other cruel, um, inhumane or degrading treatment. Um, and they continue to be subject to violence and hate crimes. So our work um, is um, in embassies across the world is to protect the rights of LGBT uh, people through international institutions. So the UE, um, UN, EU, Council of Europe, Commonwealth, and the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And it's an important part of our work um, you know, to promote um, this issue. Um, and uh, we take action even on individual cases around the world where people have been persecuted or discriminated against. Um, and I've personally done uh, one of these in um, Bahrain. Um, it was long, drawn out, and pretty controversial. We like to think we had a good outcome in the end. Um, um, our embassies and high commissions also support the work of civil society and organisations in their efforts to change social attitudes and behaviour towards LGBT people. Now, at the moment, we are concerned about a number of reports of Pride events and diversity marches overseas being cancelled um, and allegations of violence towards participants and the organisers. Um, our former FCO Minister for Human Rights, Jeremy Brown, um, was clear in his message last year when he condemned all such violence and discrimination he encouraged governments to act to ensure that all people, including lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender citizens, are free to live their lives in a safe and just environment. And in response to the cancellation of the 2012 uh, Belgrade, Pride, uh, Belgrade Pride Parade um, in October, um, the Minister for Europe, David Liddington, um, made it clear that every government um, has a responsibility to protect and promote the rights of all its citizens and not least of those in marginalised societies. So in banning the 2012 Belgrade Pride Parade, the, Serb the Serbian government has failed to meet that responsibility. So combating against LGB uh, LGBT uh, people is one of the UK's priorities for the chairmanship of the Council of Europe. And the UK has delivered a conference in Strasbourg on combating the discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender across Europe. And this conference highlighted the concern of discrimination against LGBT people, which continues to be widespread in Europe, and I think your map clearly com um, confirms that. So during this conference, uh, uh, we announced a contribution of £100,000 to, um, 100, yes, to assist um, the work of the Council um, LGBT issues. And in September, the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers held a debate on the subject of discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. And this identified concrete actions to take forward. And I believe that there is now a review, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, yeah, there's a review on the implementation of the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers, and there are recommendations being taken place on measures to combat discrimination against LGBT people. So our work on the, um, with the EU on this issue has been important, um, and I think that the EEAS Human Rights Democracy Strategic Framework adopted last year um, includes the uh, commitment of EU members and the EEAS, which will work together to develop a strategy on cooperation with third countries on the human rights of LGBT people. And this will include the UN and the Council of Europe. And the UK is determined to contribute fully to a robust and effective EU strategy that will make a difference in the lives of LGBT. 
Um, there are some further developments I'd like to point out as well, um, just to highlight the work we have done. Um, for example, in Chile, um, the President has now signed the first ever anti-discrimination law, uh, which includes discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, and which came into effect in July last year. And in Hungary, legislation which extends hate crime to include sexual orientation and gender came into force this year. But there are um, also concerns and response to new legislation banning the promotion of homosexuality in some regions of, in Russia. Um, the UK has supported a statement on tolerance and non-discrimination delivered by France at the OSCE Permanent Council. Um, I've got a number of other issues which I can kind of highlight, but I won't bore you with a full list because I'm sure, you know, I've talked long enough. Um, but it is encouraging when I go back to um, my opening statement to say that it's really since the turn of the 21st century that Britain has really made um, um, an effort uh, to provide um, equality. And now it is good to hear that today LGBT citizens have most of the same legal rights as normal citizens. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, finally, we have not yet heard from Mrs. Pietruchova, so I would like to ask her to tell us a little bit more about what's happening in her department in the field of equal treatment. First of all, I need to say that I'm not in a very good position here because I've uh, seen the figures and I identify myself with all the figures. Uh, I don't deny any of that. From those of you who come from abroad, I need to say that the situation in Slovakia does not only reflect the situation with LGBT, even though that might be the most extreme one, but uh, we have a very prejudiced environment here against people of various colors of the, the face, uh, and it also um, is towards the Islamic community. Um, in um, general, we can say that uh, everybody who is different in some way is being prejudiced against. Of course, the situation might be different in rural areas compared to Bratislava, so we can hardly talk about Slovakia in general, because it's not like we have one Slovakia, we have various regions and various attitudes. However, um, unfortunately, uh, the figures reflect reality, and I would be very glad if we had discussions like this on other grounds, uh, because persuading those who are persuaded already does not make much sense. We can talk here about what we would need to do, but uh, unfortunately, none of us can change the situation in reality. And uh, the support of embassies is uh, very great, and we, we are grateful for it. And uh, we can only thank for it, uh, but uh, probably in the parliament, such debate would be much more fruitful. When it comes uh, to the equal opportunities uh, issue, we are mainly dealing in our department with uh, gender equality. It means equality between men and women. However, it doesn't mean we don't deal with other topics. Um, and uh, with the Ministry of Justice, uh, it's not quite clear who is uh, the patron of the law on anti-discrimination. When it comes to the public space uh, and uh, labor relations and the criminal code, uh, Slovakia has very standard, quite progressive legislation. Uh, the other thing is how enforceable the legislation is in practice, and that does not apply only to the sexual orientation, it applies uh, to uh, different types of law courts, but we don't have many lawsuits uh, concerning sexual orientation. 
I remember one lawsuit from Brezino. But that uh, does not apply to discrimination only. It's about the uh, bad mood in Slovakia that it doesn't make sense to go to police or to law court because I can't win anyway. So when it comes to the protection of human rights uh, in Slovakia, of course it applies to everybody and it applies the same way to LGBT population. Here we need to focus on people who are more, most remarkably suffering in this country. And when it comes to uh, professional uh, debate, everybody is uh, quite clear with the fact that we need to change something. Uh, when it comes to public discussion, uh, usually everybody is being put off by the public debate because the people who are engaged in uh, discussions those usually suffer afterwards uh, due uh, or as a result of, of such prejudices the most. So it's not enough if LGBT activists speak. We would need uh, the silent majority to identify themselves uh, with the fact that it's not just about the the rights of the others. It's about the rights of everybody. You never know who your daughter or son will be. So you better protect the right for everybody. In our department um, at the ministry, we are a drafting a new program for the next programming period. And uh, we are expecting projects concerning anti discrimination campaigns. And as long as I'm in my position, I can imagine we will create grounds for campaigns for support of um, actual projects especially projects uh, focusing on institutional uh, establishment uh, for prevention and elimination of uh, discrimination. Uh, we don't need to talk about the situation in Slovakia. Uh, formally, we do have equality body, but in reality, the practice lacks behind the theory so much. Uh, there is a national center for human rights, but uh, having just one institution is not enough, especially in regions uh, where the branches don't work well enough. So we know there is a room for improvement. And when it comes to the strategy for human rights, I know that uh, there is a, uh, the majority agreement uh, on the fact that uh, we need to deal with the institutional background and enforceability of human rights. If I look at the results from Czech Republic, I feel sad because we used to be one country for a long time. And obviously, we are two different worlds now, although we may be close to each other in um, the cultural sense or mentality, but when it comes to recognizing the rights and equal treatment and um, color of your skin, then we need to learn a lot from our Czech friends. And when we discuss these issues on European grounds, um, um, I know that the map is really correct. It's a problem of all post-socialist countries. It's as if we are heading in a different direction than we should be heading. It's. Um, obvious that uh, even if there are some efforts to do something, uh, there are always people uh, who will try to defend 
the rights of minorities and we need to start from the school age. I know that uh, the troubles are rooted in the primary schools or even in the kindergartens. So this is where we should start. We should start with parents and teachers. So um, once again, I know I am not in a, a very good position here. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from our panelists now a lot of information coming from different perspectives uh, about the situation of LGBT people. And I think now it's maybe time for you to ask some questions. So please ask and say if you have a question for a specific panel member or you can just ask in general and we'll figure out who will answer that. And here's an eager lady. Thank you. May I speak Slovak? Thank you for the floor. Thank you for the contributions of our panelists. My question, or maybe my observation, is towards Mrs. Petruchova. I'm glad you mentioned the strategy of human rights because that was a hot topic in summer. You mentioned human rights strategy because uh, it is something that includes all the rights and uh, you also mentioned that people who had nothing to say to this also commented on this strategy so what is the group of people that should not comment on this you said that this is a strategy for everybody so everybody has a right to comment on it, right? And my second question is, the silent majority should not be silent. They should talk about it. That's what happened in the summer. The strategy was supposed to be adopted in a very silent manner in summer when everybody's on vacation. Let's hurry up and adopt the strategy when no one comments. And let's hurry up and accept it in September. And when the silent majority stopped to be silent and there was lots of negative uh, response uh, against it, uh, fortunately, and that's what happened, the silent majority stopped to be silent. My name is Jana Djuricova. I'm here on my own behalf. I'm not representing any organization. Thank you for the floor. You will not get an answer, but nonetheless, uh, I will try to respond. I am not suffering with Alzheimer's. I was talking about the rights of minorities. I was not talking about the strategy itself, which was be being commented by people who are not directly affected by the strategy. And um, I'm not in agreement with what you've said. You said that the silent majority stopped to be silent. I think it was just a shouting minority that stopped to be silent. From the survey, we know that the acceptance of registered partnership um, is rising. More than half of our population has no problem with some sort of arra legal arrangement for homosexual partnerships. So I think once again you are trying to say that uh, the government was trying to silently adopt some strategy. There were five public discussions. I think that's a very open way of governing some issue. I think we are moving forward uh, with open uh, government 
morning, and uh, we really had an open discussion there, and the strategy will still be discussed in the future. Uh, I insist on the fact that in decent democracies, there should be a subsidiarity system, so the rights should be commented mainly by people who are affected by them. How do LGBT rights affect you? How do LGBT rights affect you? What do you have to do with them? Unfortunately, we don't have mic, so we can't translate. We probably should move on then. A gentleman in the back. My name is Ernest Gezer. I believe LGBT people are not discriminated against in Slovakia. Uh, I don't think Slovakia discriminates against homosexuals. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Pietrochova. If uh, you believe they are discriminated against, tell me. Tell me an example. Uh, when it comes to majority population, of course, there are problems, uh, but I believe homosexuals cause them themselves. Uh, the, the pride uh, parade, I think that's something counterproductive. If you want heterosexuals to like you, then you should not provoke. You should behave decently. But uh, when you uh, look at the Pride Parade, there would be people with orange uh, hair, and there would be drumming, okay, making noise, and they want everybody else to like them. Why don't they behave decently so that we like them? Well, let me just add to that that I think ever since 1989, the Velvet Revolution, you do have the right of assembly in this country. And right of assembly means that any group can demonstrate, have a parade, and enjoy themselves. And there really shouldn't be anything wrong with that. I participated in the Bratislava Pride March, and I don't remember anything impolite or... <laughs> but we're not in Madrid, we're in Bratislava. And the march that here was very polite. What wasn't polite were the smoke bombs that were thrown, presumably not by LGBT people. And that really is a shame. And that's not a good reflection on a society that's part of the EU now and is no longer connected with the East. But in any case, let me let Slovak speak. Short response. Um, you know, there is democracy in Slovakia, there is freedom in Slovakia. Uh, even uh, groups which are close to neo fascism can walk around Bratislava and demonstrate and uh, show their respect to their idols. Uh, I know this is extremist. But um, someone minds pride. I didn't see any half-naked or orange people. Some uh, people don't like uh, someone else kneeling down and respecting uh, um, or praying to their uh, idols. This is a democratic country. You don't need to go there. You don't need to look at these people. It's your choice. I don't think any of my LGBT friends need you to like them. These people don't need to need you to like them. They just want you to respect them and respect their rights. They want to be part of uh, this society. And I am ashamed of people who are against them like you are. Just very shortly. It seems funny to me um, when there is, when we are in the country, when there is a parade of masks, there are carnivals in every village every year, and nobody minds that. And you don't mind people in masks there, so it really is about acceptance. There is very low acceptance of LGBT people here in this country. To add one or two words, um, the statement that people in Slovakia are not discriminated against would contradict our findings, at least. 
um, and uh, I believe that the thousand people who participated in our research after also, by the way, cleaning up the data, etc., um, have reported in, in all honesty. On the issue of gay pride parades, I think the courts have spoken very wise words. Uh, the court in Strasbourg who dealt with a lot of cases on freedom of assembly, in particular in relation to Poland and Russia, has clearly stated that especially demonstrations which um, send a message that the majority would disagree with should also be protected for the sake of democracy and freedom of expression. Very well put. First timers, first chance. Yes. Hello, uh, I am Jana Lajczykova from the Center of the Research of Ethnicity and Culture. I'm not really dealing with this topic directly. I deal with national minorities uh, and n ethnic minorities. And what seems to me, what strikes me, is the atmosphere fear of fear. What is common uh, between my issue and this issue is uh, the, the fear. And I think politically this is very dangerous. So my question is, uh, where, the, where is this fear of the majority Slovaks coming from? Why they are feeling worried uh, or threatened? And how to start with alternative discourse, for instance, with the Roma minority. It is very difficult because we have politicians here who are just competing in being more repressive. And it's very difficult to talk here about affirmative actions here. And it seems as though very similar uh, dynamics can be seen in the rights of LGBT people. That was just an observation or comment. Any panel member would like to add to that, or shall we go on to the next question? Um, yeah, um, no, it's quite interesting to hear about the fear um, issue, and that definitely was um, very much part of the debate in, in the UK um, when um, it was allowed to have um, openness about their sexuality in, in the military forces. Um, um, that, was a, that was an enormous debate. There is a fear. It's, it's cultural. Um, it probably goes back to this idea of um, homosexuality being evil in 1533. I mean, um, and I think that that's, that's a mindset um, I think it would be healthy to have something in Parliament to lead the way, to take away that, that fear. Um, I know that in every civil um, society in Britain, every government department, you have to have this openness and debate. Um, you have to have teachers' forums for, um, for gay teachers, not to have um, any discrimination from the pupils and to get support about that. So it really is, starts from the top, it's pyramidal, and then as it filters down, you get rid of that fear and it becomes normal. That's also a short word for me. Um, I cannot claim to have made a, a big study here in Slovakia on the roots of fear, but obviously education comes to mind immediately. I mean, the quality of school books, the inclusion of tolerance and respect for diversity in curricula, this is all where it starts, that indeed uh, we start at, at the very basic level. Um, what, of course, different groups in minority groups have in common is that they are faced with responses from majorities in society. Uh, we, we also look, for example, at the position of Jewish people in, 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 in the EU, uh, ethnic minorities, Roma, and we can see patterns when it comes to not daring to report uh, discrimination or, or a hate crime. Uh, being pushed in, into a corner. So we, we see patterns of, of discrimination and violence, violent attacks among different groups, and that would also perhaps urge the need to, to focus on different groups and what they have in common, etc. Yeah. 
Um, maybe I, I would argue with you whether this is really a fear. Um, it seems to be to that it's more of a hatred than fear. Because, of, to be honest, what are they afraid of? Uh, so it really seems to me it's uh, it's, it's um, not being willing or not trying uh, to understand or accept otherness. I think that's the major problem. We are not willing uh, to try and see what the position of the others is and to walk in their shoes. In, instead of trying to walk in their shoes, they are defending themselves with an iron wall. And that's why we did not move anywhere in 20 years' time. And mentally, we probably moved in an opposite. That's not completely the case. I'd like to be an optimist like most Americans. But let's have another question. The gentleman in the back. A question to the uh, Slovak government representative. Um, what what has been done, or what could be done, to use the electronic and print media to combat discrimination against the LGBT community, to promote tolerance, to promote, promote equality, to promote diversity? Um. I believe we would need an Elton John or um, another celebrity which is generally acceptable to public and which would not be afraid to publicly and openly speak about them being lesbian, be, being gay or bisexual, so that everybody can see that someone who they love for something they've done is a representative of the community they are afraid of or that they, they hate, etc. I've talked to my colleague from Czech Republic recently, and um, in Czech Republic um, you can see that shift. In Slovakia, we have very primitive uh, reality shows, uh, like exchange of wives. Uh, and in Czech Republic, there was a lesbian pair already present on such TV show, which is unheard of in Slovakia. Um, so media do represent a huge space, and they formulate people's opinions. But for instance, on STV2, there was a great document on uh, gender identity. I don't know how many people watched it, but I think that could be an early sign of some move forward. So we need, really need some positive models to be shown in media. Mm, I'd like to continue in what Mrs. Piedruchova said um, and uh, the issue of fear. I know uh, that the fear comes from unknown and this white spot can be filled with the various imaginations or prejudices uh, and that's being abused many times and the survey prove that people who personally know a gay or lesbian have very different attitude to this community than people who don't know that they have such people in their vicinity. Unfortunately, uh, these people do not feel comfortable enough in Slovakia, especially outside Bratislava, that they would openly, openly accept their sexual orientation. This is uh, slowly changing, and hopefully it's going to change soon. It's such massive resistance that we can see here might um, be a sign of um, some change when the law on registered partnership was uh, drafted in 2001 it was very absurd no one in the parliament uh, discussed this issue it took an hour for mps uh, to get rid of this topic uh, 
and uh, discussion recently was massive. It took more than a day. So we can see that uh, uh, the, the, the fear of this change coming is, is much larger. And th that's good. That's Thursday discussion. Um, good evening, Lazo Oravets. I'm thinking about the title of today's discussion. We are supposed to talk about acceptance here, and acceptance is the last stage in the process. There is a lack of knowledge, we need to learn something, then we need to respect, tolerate, and then we can accept. And uh, the red uh, threat comes from east to west, as we've seen. But uh, uh, we should really see the differences inside this post-communist Europe. Uh, these countries uh, are not close to Western countries, but internally they differ. And we uh, show quite negative attitudes to many groups. It starts to be a stigma for Slovakia that we probably would will be the last bastion of prejudices in Europe. We will defend our prejudices. Uh, we will defend the whole agenda of, of prejudices for very long, probably. It seems as though the impact of uh, the Russian mentality uh, is quite high. I think it's related to higher level of conservatism in this country. And secondly, uh, this country lacks attitude. One huge problem uh, is uh, this positively formed ideas and visions uh, and opinions uh, which might be pro-diversity. Uh, we lack opinions uh, of intellectual elites in the society which would define vision for this country respecting diversity. And if you take the whole political spectrum from right to left, politicians do not present their opinions on gays, lesbians, Roma, or women, etc. So, so there is absence of values in this country, and I think that harms our going forward very much. Thank you. I am disappointed uh, from uh, the attitude of political and religious authorities when it comes to LGBT community. I'd like to ask our guests from abroad, uh, what would happen to a politician abroad if they uh, build an agenda on uh, an attitude which does not really exist and build, its, build his preferences uh, on these uh, because uh, in Slovakia this helps, this doesn't harm. freedom of expression and you have freedom to say what you believe in and you can stand up in any place to actually push that right forward. So um, people would listen, you have the right to say it, people would listen and would accept it and they would respect that view because it's ultimately about respecting people's rights to say what they want to. Um, so um, we have a little stand in Hyde Park um, where you can stand up on your soapbox at any time of day or night 
and you can say what you want to push forward, what a gender issue you want to push forward, and you have the right to say that. So uh, it isn't really an issue for us in, in Britain. Does that help? Um, but I would like to contribute to your question, um, not so much from my own country, but rather on the research we did. Uh, the, I think different politicians have chosen different ways, different ways of. Yeah, works again. Um, different politicians have chosen different ways of expressing themselves, and some politicians have understood that uh, this is not about gay rights or LGBT rights. This is about fundamental rights that also apply to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender persons. Sometimes there's a confusion there that this is a, a special needs discussion or that there is a special group that needs new rights or special rights. There's no way that this is the topic. This is about human rights, the indivisible human rights for all. And those politicians, I think, who have understood that have also been able to speak out in a very consistent manner when it is against racism, anti-Semitism, uh, etc. And in fact, I think some politicians have actually understood that they can gain voters um, with uh, this tolerant and respectful message. We asked in our survey what should be changed, and many of the respondents said we would like to get more positive discourse from politicians, from opinion leaders. We want to hear, um, we don't want silly jokes, we want serious uh, discussions among politicians addressing the needs of us, of our families. We have children in our families, we want the same rights, we want our kids to grow up in relationships that are recognized. If something happens to one of us, that also the, the position of the child is secured. This is what everyday LGBT citizens in the EU want. Very normal needs, in fact. Thank you. I think the lady in the back. Hello. My name is Jana Jablonicka. I'm from Initiative Otherness, as my colleague Matko. And I'm also one of the organizers of Pride Parade. Uh, you mentioned that uh, people are half naked there. I believe none of us in the civilized world, world would doubt females' franchise. And it took women to go out and demonstrate to get their right to vote. So somebody had to point out to this problem. And uh, in Western Europe, for instance, in the United States, LGBT rights uh, have been uh, already accepted and recognized, mainly because pride parades started to be organized and these people started to demonstrate for their rights. I think uh, uh, we are a tolerant society and the pride parade is uh, a reflection of that. It showed us to what level the society can tolerate otherness. Uh, but I'd like to ask you, what are we talking about if we talk about otherness? We just talk about people who want to live their lives in the families, in relationships, they want to be loved, they have their pains, they work, they have jobs, they pay taxes, and they pay contributions to social insurance. So. In what way are these people different than others? Very well put. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me uh, invite you. Uh, next week there will be a march in, in uh, Košice, National March for Life. So, as you said, uh, you participated in a um, last year in, in Pride in Bratislava, which is very great that you support uh, the rights in Slovakia and that you are interested in this topic. So I hope to see you next week 
on uh, Sunday, actually this week, on Sunday in Kosice, couple thousands people are expected and I think you can see basically there what actually Slovak people, well, majority or no, a lot of Slovak people uh, support. Um, so I hope to see you there next week. Yeah? Uh, that, that was not a question. <laughs> um, My question is uh, when we talked about the Pride Parade, uh, my question is can we expect uh, pedophiles uh, in the Pride Parade? Because we know that in Prague, pedophiles took part and gradually they want their sexual rights to be respected and accepted in society because they argue that if homosexuality is a sexual orientation which should be respected, then pedophilia is also a sexual orientation which could be accepted and should be. So they took part in a pride parade in Prague and in other countries. So my question uh, to the organizers of the Pride Parade is that can we expect uh, pedophiles? I participated in the Gay Pride in Prague last month and I was there all day. I don't recall seeing any pedophiles. I don't recall seeing a single sign supporting pedophilia. So I'm sort of wondering whether you were there as well because I didn't see anything. But let me let others respond. I am glad we have a spokeswoman to pedophiles here. Uh, I believe in the March for Life there will be pedophiles present. But the major difference between Pride Parade and uh, Parade for Life, uh, as we've uh, learned today, because it was said, uh, said aloud today, the, the, the uh, Parade for Life is not for life, is, it is for the prohibition of uh, the abortion. So the people uh, parading in Bratislava uh, want to fight for the rights of people, whereas the Kosice parade wants to prohibit the right for abortion. Myslím si, že sa trošku oddialujeme od pôvodnej témy, takže zostaneme pri téme LGBT. Hello, my name is Andrej Fogelton. And I'd like to ask you for your definition of sickness. I know uh, I should explain. I believe that homosexuality is a sickness because many times uh, homosexuality is uh, treated as being different. It's like uh, you have blue eyes, so you're different. But uh, blue eyes don't mean you don't see well. With homosexuality, you cannot give birth to a child. Therefore, you are losing something very precious. And if you are healthy, then y you can have a child. Sir, uh, you must be living in some previous century. There is a difference between artificial uh, fertilization because in normal conditions, two homosexuals cannot have a child. So if you are sick, for instance, because of because you have some problems with your legs, you cannot walk uh, without prothesis. And if you are homosexual, you can have an artificial um, insemination in, or fertilization, and you can have a child. So why don't you think? Thank you. That's can interesting. I? Um, I just wanted to add that this issue this issue has been handled by psychiatric associations decades ago, and these are experts that probably know more about it than we do here. And so I would refer you to decisions, for example, the American Psychiatric Association in 1973, literally 40 years ago, already declaring it not to be an illness. So you're a little bit behind the times, but let, let the panelists speak. Well, I was, I was going to refer to this 1973, I think WHO or the American Psychiatric Association, 
the answer is very simple. It is not an illness. That is the, uh, the result of many years of research. Unfortunately, still in some school books, including of students of medicine, we still find this, this uh, mistake. But by now, it has been... It has been uh, I mean, this is where the scientific world has agreed upon. It is not an illness. Some people are gay, other people are not gay. Some people are left-handed, other people are right-handed. It's as simple as that. I'd like to ask you, who are not heterosexuals, do you feel sick? Because when I'm ill, I feel ill. Do you feel ill? These are absurd questions. And when it comes to pedophile, pedophiles, um, this demagogy about pedophilia, um, that's something can, you, you can easily find out that it's, it's a disorder of sexual uh, orientation. It's a deviation. And if there is an act of, act of pedophilia, it's always abuse of uh, adolescents, of, of young people or, or children. And um, if you are homosexual, you are not harming anyone. You choose an adult for your sexual act. So, so you are going somewhere thousands of years ago if you are claiming this. If I may add, uh, the aims of uh, uh, Pride Parade are medialized. You can find the web page of the Pride Parade and you can find quite precisely formulated objectives, goals. Uh, they are translated to Slovak. Um, so these are matters uh, which are strictly in line with international conventions and with the understanding of uh, human rights. Uh, we are very transparent uh, and anybody who's interested can go to the web page and find out. Hello, I'd like to ask about the question of violence. The figures were alarming there. I don't know how many percent of people were attacked three times in a year from LGBT community. And hearing this for the first time, it doesn't sound very realistic. Uh, just from statistical or mathematical viewpoint, we know that uh, there is 4% of these people in the country, so one of 25 people. It means uh, that there is homophobia in the society. These people are afraid to come out. So if uh, one fourth of these people come out with being gay, so, so uh, here we are talking about very small number, very small percentage of the society. Uh, secondly, it is very difficult to see on the first sight if you are gay or not. Of course, those who know these people, who know they are gay, their friends, their, their relatives, their acquaintances would not attack them. So. Uh, we're talking about one in hundred people here, and even if I know about his sexual orientation, he needs to meet somebody who is aggressive, right? And as Mr. Matsko mentioned, uh, there is a fear present. Of course, there is a fear of unknown. And if you are afraid, you will attack you or, or you leave. It means there is a response of fight or flight. This is how it works in nature. There is this instinct of fight or flight. So you have to be really afraid of the person or you have to hate the person to attack them. So with all these factors that we count together, there is a very low probability of, of such violence. And, and what you report in, in your survey, it seems like the 
very many of these attacks. So it seems like a construct to me. It doesn't seem realistic. If I had these figures, uh, I would uh, really be suspicious about some methodological mistakes or something. Uh, doesn't seem realistic. Uh, I don't think the, the, the rate of hate is so high. There might be a fear of unknown, but who is the one that really attacks these people? Could you? Well, the, I do not agree, obviously, with, with, with your comments. Um, these are the responses from 93,000 uh, persons who responded to the, to the survey. In fact, we had, I think, 115,000 respondents, but after clearing up the data and after very serious scientific research and uh, comparing the data, these were out. This is an EU average. This is something that you have to keep in mind. Um, the group I was referring to, the group that uh, faces up to sometimes three uh, attacks per year, is the transgender community. Part of the transgender community is more visible than uh, perhaps the LGB community. Um, and actually, there, it is not as simple as, as you have portrayed. The perpetrators of anti-LGBT violence actually uh, are sometimes very vocal and uh, they shout slogans by which we can, let's say, measure whether it is an anti-gay or trans uh, attack. I'm very happy to share the technical report with you, which is a very, um, as I said, technical document that explains all the steps by which we have tried to avoid that um, the, this research would be discredited. Um, the research, the technical report also outlines very clearly what we have done to avoid uh, misperceptions. But the, the 93,000 people that participated and all the safeguards that we have built in, in, in analyzing the results do not uh, confirm your reading of the, uh, of the figures. Um, may, I? Oh. Um, may I ask you, it was only physical violence? Sorry, what? Physical? Only physical violence. This was mainly physical violence, yeah. I just wanted to comment that uh, we are talking about the top of the iceberg. We're talking about the physical violence, but there is also mental violence, economic violence, uh, domestic violence, and hate speech, uh, which also is a form of uh, mental violence. And uh, I have a family and children, but uh, the moment I start to comment on this topic, I, I've learned uh, uh, I'm starting uh, to make my emails public and uh, the hate speech is, is so visible, apparent uh, all around us that we shouldn't doubt it anymore. And when it comes to pedophiles in Prague, it was um, really uh, interesting to me, and I googled it out. It's a civil association that gives information to pedophiles on what to sh should they do to help their condition. Uh, it's a, a civil association uh, w which helps uh, these people to find their place in life. This is, this is what it is all about. Very quickly, I would like to respond uh, to flight or fight instinct. Maybe Mrs. Pietruchova could add some data on this. If we thought about the comparison with uh, uh, the violence on women, we know the statistics. Of course, they are incomplete. But in reality, the logics that someone is threatening women because they are afraid of them, that's not something we believe in, right? And. Um, the attack on someone who is LGBT is not rooted in their worry, in their being afraid. 
it should definitely be based on other motivations. It would be interesting to compare. I know we have very small percentage of statistics. We don't know how deep the problem is. We don't know the real figures. We will never know to what extent people really are discriminated against in Slovakia. Thank you very much for coming up with this topic because, um, you know, for instance, we now uh, have a first large uh, survey on domestic violence on children and physical punishment on children. And if we compare it with violence on women, uh, we always come to the position of superiority, which plays a role here. If people feel superior in the family or in society, uh, that's what gives them the power, and that's why they feel that they have the legitimate right to punish somebody who is inferior. There may be different reasons for why they feel superior, but it gives them the right to, to, to punish the inferior ones. So I believe it's not fear, it's not rooted in fear, it is rooted in hatred. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to invite everybody because there are accompanying events um, to Pride Parade going on. So I would like to invite you to tomorrow's um, discussion on uh, the book by Czech historians. And they will talk about uh, the development um, from uh, the Middle Ages, and they will talk about homosexuality in different historical eras. On Friday, we will have another discussion on the rights of um, transgender community. And for the entire week, uh, we will have different um, accompanying events going on until Saturday, when there is the, the highlight of the Pride Parade event. Say you've been a wonderful audience. Uh, I've done this several times in Vienna where actually it's a little dull because you're preaching to the converted and here I see there's lots of diversity of opinion so I think especially the three or four that uh, wanted to express opposition for the openness and, and that you did speak up so that's, that's a credit to you and I hope that all of you will show up on Saturday afternoon and, and exercise your right of free assembly and speech and, and come to Gay Pride. So. Thank you again for coming, and uh, I wish you a very nice evening. And thank you to our uh, panel members here. You were great. Thank you.